you look on the other side of this sheet I just made out tonight, um, there are some, some poems from um, actually the Breviary, um, St. Bernard's Prayer to the Virgin Mary from the Divine Comedy, a translation of it. Um, actually, it's, it's Dante's, uh, it's from the, the um, Paradisio, I think. Um, and there's the poem, The Incarnation by St. John of the Cross, poem, The Nativity of Christ by Robert Southwell. Actually, that's St. Robert Southwell. Does anyone know who he was? He was a uh, martyr, hang drawn and quartered under Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, my favorite Christmas poem, which is The Burning Babe, that's not in the delivery. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's, uh, it's a beautiful poem. I just need those to you to have some sources to draw on when teaching about Mary, using poetry is a good thing. Even I quoted these in homilies for Christmas. Uh, they're, they're good to quote. Um, anyway, something I wanted to just add a little clarification um, from the class, not the last class, but the class before last. Um, <clears throat> remember Father Felder's article, or his, um, his um, chapter in the Mariology book on Mary's predestination. And uh, I, I emailed Father Felder and asked him, um, you know, that statement in regard to how uh, God's plan would have been for, you know, the Franciscan thesis, uh, Jesus becoming incarnate and the Virgin Mary, even without creation. And he made that, that statement. Okay. Um, you mean without sin? No, he said even without creation. And... Um, Yes, without sin, we can understand, okay, Jesus would have still become man, but without creation, I thought, Father, you know, I'm a little bit lost here. Well, he wrote to me saying, um, the conundrum which you brought up is fairly simply resolved. When we keep in mind the distinction between the order of intention in God's mind and will and the order of execution on the basis of the intentions of the Creator. Without the order of intention, uh, there can be no intelligibility in the order of execution. And he says, what is first is in the order of intention, I remember reading this in, in this chapter, um, what exists for its own sake and not for something outside itself is last in the order of execution. He goes on to say that if the Creator does will an incarnation, it is in the order of intention um, that it be absolutely first. So I think that's the sense he's talking about. Okay? Even if there wasn't a creation brought about, it's the order of intention precedes the order of execution. Okay? So once you understand that, I think uh, when he says even without creation, well, he's speaking about the order of intention before the order of execution. That's the nuance there. Okay. So um, I don't know if that was all that clear in his chapter, uh, his, his email to me to clarify that. And um, uh, you know, he ends by saying, as regards about the absolute primacy, redemption, and redemption of the human family, I think the distinction between order of intention and execution suffice to explain why the incarnation precedes original sin in the order of intention, but not in the order of execution. And the incarnation precedes the rest of creation in the order of intention, but not in the order of execution. So, um, anyway, to clear up any questions about that, I share that with you. Okay. Um, I have, um, since we're continuing on the the Immaculate Conception theme for this first part of the hour. I have uh, I have uh, the oldest known prayer to the Immaculate Heart of Mary by Eckbert of Schonau, who was a Benedictine abbot. Um, maybe Alex left. Did someone, did someone see Alex or we did?
It's a beautiful poem. I made reference to it earlier in uh, discussing Genesis 3.15. It's the, the first prayer to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And the Immaculate Heart of Mary, um, the heart in, in let's say, biblical anthropology, um, represents the interior of the person. It is the simple par excellence of the person's interiority. If we know someone's heart, we know the person. And um, it is a symbol of thinking, of willing, of emotions, um, really of the entire person. And that is why it became popular early on to associate Mary's immaculate conception, her, her immaculate spotless being from her conception with her heart, because the heart is a symbol of the person. And Eckbert, lived in the 12th century. And this is the first prayer to Mary's heart that, that we are aware of. Maybe someone will come up with something in the future, but this is the earliest. And um, what's significant, he used the term immaculate heart. Um, later in the tradition, as we go through the centuries, with St. John Eudes, for instance, um, he referred to Mary's most pure heart but Eckbert, you know, 500 years before him, or 400 years before him, um, speaks of Mary's immaculate heart. And uh, the, my footnote on the bottom here um, refers to, uh, this was, this was uh, a critical edition that was done by a scholar, and um, F. W. E. Roth. And, uh, and then, actually, a new critical edition by uh, Henri Barre, a uh, Holy Spirit Father. And so this is, this is the best you can, you can hope for as far as date, something dating back in those centuries. And uh, it's beautiful because um, he, Eckbert, addresses Mary, um, addresses her heart as if he, he's addressing her. I shall speak to your heart, O Mary. I shall speak to your heart so pure, sovereign of the universe. I shall offer my veneration from the depths of my soul. From the depths of my heart, I shall greet your immaculate heart. In other words, heart to heart, okay? Um, cor out of cor, loc locator, as, as Newman used to say, okay? Heart, heart speaking to heart. That's what Eckhart is doing here to the heart of Mary. And. My heart shall greet yours. First in this world was worthy to receive the only Son of the Supreme God, coming forth from the bosom of the Father. The bosom or heart of the Father. That's how it's been interpreted in the, in the tradition. That's John 1.18. Um, the word comes forth from, from the bosom of the Father or the heart of the Father, as it's been interpreted. And um, here we see that um, Mary was the first to receive her son in her heart. He's, what he's referring to here, we could say, is she's conceiving Jesus in her heart. The um, womb of her heart, you may say. Okay. When she gives her fiat. And then there's the greeting. Okay, that's the introduction. The greeting, hail singular shrine that God has sanctified for himself and the Holy Spirit. Hail, holy of holies, that the sovereign pontiff has consecrated by his ineffable entrance. Now, the sovereign pontiff doesn't refer to the pope. This refers to Christ. Okay? This is poetic language. Okay? Hail, ark of the sanctification that contains the writing of the finger of God. The finger of God is a reference to the Holy Spirit. Okay? Um, Call the finger of God in the tradition. So with these, these lines, he's referring to Mary as as the Ark, as, as the Holy of Holies. And um, he goes on with these beautiful descriptions. Hail, urn of gold that contains the heavenly manna filled with the delight of the angels. And because Jesus is that, that uh, bread of angels, the Eucharist. 
pale royal court, true Solomon's house of cedar, whose sweet fragrance surpasses all the woods of cedar. Hail, couch of gold, the most agreeable rest for the desirable beloved, whose head is of perfect gold, room filled with heavenly perfume, precious spices, virtues. Hail, enclosed paradise, okay? These are scriptural references, okay? Um, I forget where the enclosed paradise is. That's in, I think it's maybe the Song of Songs. Um, wherein the cunning seducer of Eve had never dared to crawl. So um, this is a veiled reference to what? For a Matthew conception. Well, we're, we're talking about that, yes. Okay, and, and Genesis. And Genesis 3.15, okay. Satan never dared to crawl. Uh, he, he will never be able to strike Mary's heel or the heel of Christ for that man, okay. So, hail sealed fountain, another scriptural reference. Who secrets the violator of hearts has never tasted. Again, a reference to Satan. Not even tasting the slightest sip. So, uh, it's clear in, in Eckbert's mind that Mary is an act of conceived here. Satan never had a grip on her, never even tasted um, you know, the, the beautiful wine that, of, of her being, so to speak. And to whom do we compare you? To what do we assimilate the beatitude of your heart, O Mary? By what words do we worthily greet the intimate sweetness of your chaste breast? And then um, goes on, live, live, and rejoice eternally, O holy and immaculate heart, in which the salvation of the world was begun, and in which the divinity has embraced our humanity, bringing peace to the world. So you see here he's relating the heart of Mary to her womb. She's conceived in her heart, which is, that's actually um, an ancient theme. Uh, St. Augustine, St. Leo the Great, talked about Mary conceiving Jesus first in her heart before in her womb. And Eckbert is kind of combining them here, you could say. Okay? And um, be filled with eternal jubilation, you emerald conch, whose color has never faded, you who have poured out to the Supreme King, thirsting for salvation, the sweet nectar of faith, at the hour when the angel pronounced the good news, saying, Behold the hand of the Lord. And um, thus you have delighted, you have filled his heart in such a degree from thou on, from heaven, he would proclaim more joyously, My delights are to be with the children of men. So Mary's heart pleased the heart of Christ. This is a medieval theme that, that Mary's immaculate nature and her immaculate heart attracted the Son to become flesh in her womb. St. Bernard says this, St. Alred of Revolve says this as well. And so Eckbert's picking up on this, this beautiful medieval tradition. May every soul magnify you, O Mother of Sweetness. And this is from the Magnificat. My soul doth magnify the Lord. So we want to, uh, all of us want to praise and magnify Mary's greatness, okay? So a beautiful prayer. Now on the other side of this is the greatest prayer, the heart of Mary, that has ever penned. Okay? Uh, how many of you are familiar with William Joseph Chaminade? Have you heard of him? Okay. He was the founder of the Marianists in the um, early to mid-1800s. The Society of Mary, they're, they're known as the Marianists. And um, uh, back in the early 1800s, um, Chaminade hadn't founded his congregation yet, but he was involved in, in um, different Marian societies and uh, confraternities. And um, as I say here, down about halfway in that first paragraph. Um, uh, in the great Marian congregations of Bordeaux, a prayer to the heart of Mary has always been recited in the oldest text, which is found in all the editions of the Manual of the Servant of Mary. These were the, what Shamanad uh, uh, put these together back in, in 1801. Shamanad, by the way, fled to, during uh, the French Revolution, 
he fled to, um, to Spain. And he prayed before the, um, the oldest shrine of Our Lady. Does anyone know what the oldest shrine of Our Lady dedicated to Our Lady is? It's, it's a dedication to the oldest appearance of Our Lady. Um, Our Lady of the Pillar. She, she, I went to the center. Oh, did you? Yeah. OK. And the tradition has it she appeared to St. James, who was getting distraught, not being able to convert people. While Mary was still alive, she bilocated. That's the, that's the idea or the thought. She appears to him on a pillar to strengthen him. And that's the, the, the earliest apparition of Our Lady, St. Um, or Blessed William Joseph Shamanad. Uh, he goes to, to the shrine. And what, what city is it in? Do you remember? Zaragoza? Zaragoza, that's right. And he prays before the shrine. What should I do? You know, I, I fled from my country. And she gives him, Mary gives him the inspiration to follow the Marianists, the congregation of the servants of Mary. Um, but um, what the formulary of prayers and, and these other volumes don't tell us, which I discovered in my research, um, most of the prayer that, that um, Shamanad used, this was not original to him. It was taken from another, I mentioned in there, uh, Father Joseph Galafay. Um, he called it an exercise in honor of the Sacred Heart of Mary. Joseph Galafay was uh, a Jesuit who lived in the 1700s who promoted the cult of the hearts of both Jesus and Mary. He composed masses in honor of both hearts. And um, Joseph Galafay was formed himself by Jean Crosset, who was a spiritual director to St. Margaret Mary Alco, to whom Jesus revealed his heart. So Galafay penned most of this prayer, with the exception of the reference in the second paragraph about reparation to, to Mary's heart. William Joseph Shamanad um, maybe penned that, I don't know. I, I, I'm not aware, but most of this prayer, if you look at Galafay's prayer, uh, it's drawn from that, except the, the insert about reparation to the heart of Mary. And again, you have a prayer where um, the most pure heart of Mary, that's how the prayer begins, okay? Addressing Mary Mary's heart, which is symbolic of her retired person. So it's a beautiful prayer. I pray every Saturday morning. I just do it as a, as a devotional exercise to, to uh, honor Our Lady. And um, so the most pure, heart, most pure heart of Mary, immaculate in thy conception, and always remaining virgin, holiest, noblest, grandest, most perfect heart ever formed in a mere creature by the omnipotent hand of the Creator, unfailing source of goodness, sweetness, mercy, love, perfect image of the adorable heart of Jesus Christ. Okay, so her heart models Christ's heart most perfectly, more than any other creature. Okay. And um, who didst ever burn with the most ardent charity? She's filled with the love of God. Who did didst love God more than all the angels and saints together? Who didst render more glory to the August Trinity by the least of thy affections and was given or could be given by all other creatures through their most heroic deeds? Holy heart, in which the overtures of peace between heaven and earth were first made. That's the Annunciation and the Incarnation. Okay. That's that reference to Mary conceiving Jesus first in her heart again and by whose consent a savior was given to the world. Heart of our Redeemer's mother, who did us suffer so much for our welfare, lovest us so tenderly, in so many ways deserving of respect, love, gratitude, confidence, of all mankind. And now, uh, the part that was added to Galafay's prayer, deign to accept my lowly homage, I humbly prostrate before thee, I offer thee reparation for the outrages heaped upon thee, especially for the ingratitude of which I myself have been guilty towards thee. Now, this shows a development in, in the doctrine because um, what, if, if you know about St. Margaret Mary Alaco, one of the things she asked for in regard to um, 
pardon me, one of the things that Jesus requested of St. Margaret Mary and through her to us is that we make reparation to Christ's heart. He showed her his heart. Behold this heart, which has loved men so much and yet uh, is ignored and, and, um, and suffers so many indignities. Okay? Jesus asked for reparation to his heart. And because the hearts of Jesus and Mary were so closely united in devotion and, and um, that physical uh, bond between them, the bond of love, uh, writers began to apply um, the, the notion of reparation to the heart of Christ to Mary's heart. That if Christ's heart needs reparation, so does Mary's heart. And that's why the time Galifay is writing, he doesn't think to include that. But this is um, about 100 years later, and or 120 years later, maybe, after Galifay wrote his prayer. And so now the idea of reparation to Mary's heart, as well as the heart of Christ, is made more popular. Okay. So um, I give thee thanks for the sentiments of mercy, love, which animate and still animate thee at the sight of my miseries, benefits I have received from your hands. I unite myself with all pure souls who delight in uh, consoling, honoring, pleasing, loving thee. And um, while it finishes off, I won't read the whole thing, but very, very beautiful prayer. Uh, so the first prayer of Mary's Immaculate Heart, and then another one which, which both incorporate this idea of Mary, Mary's Immaculate Conception. We apply that idea to her heart because her heart is the, the um, symbol par excellence of her interior life. And we just come back down to hold. Yeah, okay. Right. okay good. I just want to show a couple of other things here. I need to do that. Oh no, I wouldn't touch anything over oh. here. I think it's just. The maybe, one, no? Yeah, I hit that the thing on your end again. The F4 button. Yeah. <coughs> and just click off the screen, or click off that, away from that part. Just in your document, in your Word document, click in the Word document. In the Word document. Okay. Now it's not showing up to reduce it a little bit. There we go. Okay. Okay. Now, regarding Mary's Immaculate Heart, with the, the growing acceptance of the revealed doctrine, Immaculate Conception. During the 16th, 17th centuries, many um, writers use that as a basis for speaking about the gifts, graces, virtues with which Our Lady was endowed in her heart. And looking at the heart of Mary through the lens of the Immaculate Conception serves to enrich the latter doctrine. It enables authors to more readily see that not only is Mary, her heart, free from all stain of sin, from conception, a negative aspect. She is filled with a superabundance of grace <coughs> as well. Okay. And here's a prayer from Pope Julius II from the early 1500s. Okay. O most glorious Queen of Mercy, I salute your virgin heart, which, being most pure, was free from every kind of infection of sin. I salute your most noble soul, adorned with its most precious gifts, graces, Virtues. Okay. Now, um, writers such as um, such as um, Francis de Sales, um, Etienne Binet, Paul de Berry, uh, Saint John Hughes, they were all kind of more or less contemporaries within a hundred years of each other. Um, they insist that from the moment of Mary's immaculate conception, um, Mary loved God perfectly and consecrated her heart to Him. Now, her heart wasn't formed physically, but this is the idea of the heart being the symbol of the interior life of, of, 
of our league. Okay? Um, and um, this is in accord with biblical anthropology. Okay? And, um, and I go on the next paragraph. The logical consequence oops, um, of linking Mary's heart with her immaculate conception is to use the term or the adjective immaculate to describe her heart. And this, this trend that we, that we begins uh, will gain popularity in the years that follow. That's why it's unique that Eckberg, back in the 1100s, he uses immaculate. And that's really, that we really didn't catch on. The pure heart of Mary was what was used, okay? Most pure heart or pure heart. And John Hughes, St. John Hughes, in his book, The Admirable Heart of Mary, it was the, the first great work on the Blessed Virgin's heart, he referred to Mary's heart as the most pure heart. And, um, and this is a quote from him. First of all, divine bounty miraculously preserved the heart of the mother of our Savior from the stain of sin, which never touched it because God filled it with grace from the moment of its creation, clothed it with purity so radiant that next to God's, it is impossible to conceive greater purity. Now. Those words were used by Pope Alexander VII. We studied just uh, last week. Okay? Um, I'm wondering if he took them from St. John the Hughes. They were so close. Um, anyway, Divine Majesty possessed her heart so completely from the first instant that it, that it never ceased for a moment to belong entirely to him. So Mary's heart was totally dedicated, totally consecrated to God from the in the first moment of her conception. Now what does that imply? That she had a reason, the use of her reason, in order to do this. And the authors like Francis de Sales and others, they say that Mary was endowed with the use of reason from her conception. That's not a doctrine of the church, it is, say, a pious opinion. Okay? Uh, I have a, a separate class on Mary's knowledge, which we're going to come to later. So I'm just going to touch on that right now because it is related to Mary's immaculate conception. Okay? Well, well, where are they? Where are they getting that information? I mean, where? Where? How do they know that? Uh, there. Well, one of the the, the arguments that um, John Hughes and Francis de Sales use is that if Eve, at her creation, was endowed with all the gifts of knowledge, then Mary should have been from her conception. Right. There's, no, there's no evidence in Revelation for this other than making, uh, it's, it's, you could say it's, um, 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 you know, a pious opinion and um, it's, it's theological speculation. Okay. There's no you know, definite teaching on this. Okay. Okay. Yes? The idea of the heart, could you relate that to, because that's not a, like a Thomistic uh, category. Could you, I don't know, maybe what aspects of, and I'm not a Thomist, but what aspects of maybe a, a Thomist understanding of, I don't know, the will and the reason and the intellect and desire would fit the concept of the heart. I mean, can those be? Well, this is it's biblical anthropology. Okay. Uh, this is revealed in the scripture. Thomas wouldn't deny this. Thomas, in his writings, acknowledges well, this. How, how might he? Because, because even in the scriptures, it says that God has a heart. And um, uh, when you um, give an example, when Samuel goes to anoint. David, he thinks it's this big strapping guy, one of the sons of Jesse, the first one he sees. God says, no, it's not him. Well, it's this guy. No, it's not him. It's not him. It's not him. Who is it? Go get David. Man sees the appearance, but God sees the heart. That's only an example. There's an excellent book by a, a father, Boven Mars, B-O-V-E-N-M-A-R-S. Father Boven Mars. Uh, he does a whole biblical anthropology of the heart. This is this is revealed in scripture. Okay? So this wasn't created just out of nothing. And actually, it's beyond scripture. It's in all cultures. All cultures have, have looked to the heart as the symbol of the person. The Egyptians used to weigh someone's heart after they died. 
to determine whether they were, whether they were, whether they were a good or a bad person. Uh, you know about the uh, North American martyrs, the, uh, the, the, the Mohawks, they, they took out their hearts and ate them because they thought they would get courage. So in, in all of human history, it is a primordial symbol, but it's also revealed in scripture. The heart is the symbol of thinking, of willing, of memory, of emotions, okay? So this is, it's very biblical. Mary of Agrita, uh, she has a very nice uh, um, description of, of all the gifts that Mary received <coughs> at her conception. I mean, and, but this, again, this is private revelation. It's not anything that trying to guess. Yeah. But I, I kind of just um, uh, need clarifications on why um, both biblically and um, in, in the church's documents, if we seem to find more of the use of the heart. And when we look, sometimes I try to get get confused in trying to put a distinction between if the heart is the tissue that we find in the human body or some other thing because the soul is not used and then in the in the in the scripture you see Mary singing the Magnificat saying my soul and now it's not used the heart is not used I'm trying to get the well in, in the tradition they're they're used almost interchangeably heart and soul that's why I said with with, um, with Luke, chapter 235, when Simeon takes the baby Jesus in his arms and says, this child will be the rise and the fall of many in Israel and be like a sword that will pierce your soul. Okay. Origen, in the second century, he says, this will be like a sword that will pierce your heart. And that catches on in the tradition. Okay. And then artwork begins okay, with portraying Mary's heart as, as being pierced with a sword or seven swords. We just celebrated uh, last week the, the seven holy founders, the, the servants of Mary, or servants as they're called. They, they popularized the, uh, the seven sorrows of, of the Virgin okay, with, with the image of seven swords through her heart. So with, in, in, the, in our Catholic tradition, um, heart and soul are used kind of interchangeably. We're not talking about the physical heart necessarily. It's it's a metaphor and it's a symbol, but it is it is biblical because we have we have many scriptural references to the heart as um, you know. I'm trying to think of some more now off the top of my head. I, nothing comes to mind right now, but uh, to both the old and I think there are seven over seven hundred references to heart in the Old Testament and three hundred in the New. Ezekiel. Writes the scriptures no longer in tablets. And, and, and oh, Ezekiel says, God will give you a new heart. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, what Psalm, does that mean? The meaning, Psalms, too. Pardon me? The Psalms. Oh, yes. I mean, the, the scriptures are filled with them. Yes. With references to heart. Now, I'm going to switch tracks a little bit here to finish off on the Immaculate Conception just for about the last uh, um, few minutes of this hour. Okay. Um, the Immaculate Conception in art, the challenge and the resolution with the help of the saint. Um, now just think about this. We, if you were trying to portray through art, a painting, for example, the Immaculate Heart of Mary, how would you do it? It's interesting. It's a challenge for artists, okay? Well, um, Okay, how to depict Mary's heart? Um, her back to conception, I should say. Okay, not her heart, but uh, um, her back to conception artistically. Okay. Um, early depictions <coughs> portray Mary crushing Satan's head okay, from Genesis 3.15, communicate triumph over the cause of original sin, that's Satan. Okay. But do not truly communicate the notion of Mary's sinlessness and her fullness of grace. So. Uh, later in art, Revelation 12 was used as, as uh, a foundation. The woman clothed with the sun, moon under her feet, on her head a crown of 12 stars. Uh, this was used as a type of Mary to show her immaculate conception. Okay. 
And in the 15th century, the notion of tota pulchra, you are all beautiful, my beloved, there was no blemish in you, Song of Songs 4-7, was combined with Revelation 12-1. Well, um, the resolution, this is the background to it, okay, uh, there was a mystic. She was canonized a saint, uh, I believe, under John Paul II, St. Beatrice da Silva died in 1491. She founded the first contemplative order of the Immaculate Conception in Spain in about 1484. And she did much to influence the devotion to Mary's Immaculate Heart, or pardon me, her Immaculate Conception amongst the Spaniards. And according to biography, she was granted a vision of Mary as the Immaculate Conception clothed in a white tunic and a blue mantle. The very colors Beatrice chose for the habit of her order. Now, Beatrice's vision inspired the great Spanish painter, Francisco Pacheco. Okay? That's, um, he was painting in the uh, first half of the 17th century. Okay? And his artistic portrayal of the Immaculate Conception. You can Google this and, and see different uh, conceptions. The artist did not only one, they had different conceptions, but basically the same, you know, different nuances, okay? And uh, Pacheco, in turn, influenced his great pupils, okay? Diego Velasquez, which was Pacheco's son-in-law, uh, Bartolome Murillo, and uh, Francisco de Zoroban, okay? And their famous renditions of the Immaculate Conception. So, move on here. Uh, the breakthrough, Spanish painter Francesco Pacheco, in his 1645 book, El Arte de la Pintura, The Art of Painting, gave the formula for painting the Immaculate Conception. Okay? Our Lady should be painted as a beautiful young girl, Tora Pultra, okay? 12 or 13 years old, wearing a white tunic, blue mantle, for that is how she appeared to the lady, Beatrice de Silva. Additionally, he said, we ought to be surrounded, she ought to be surrounded by the sun, an oval sun of white and ochre or dark yellow. <coughs> the rays of light emanate from her head or, uh, around, which is a ring of 12 stars, and under her feet is the moon. That's taken from Revelation 12, 1, of course. Okay. What does yes. it mean about the moon? I'm sorry. Yeah. So the crescent moon, the Spain has historically been uh, Islamic and Christian. Mm -hmm. Is there any connection to Islam? <clears throat> no, no. I okay. think um, other than it's, it's a reference to 12, reference okay. to uh, Revelation 12, 1. Okay. And um, that crescent moon can point either up or downwards. You're going to see that the images I'm going to show here is pointing downwards. And um, Mary should have unbound hair because only unmarried Jewish women could wear their hair loose or unbound. So, um, and Mary, as the Immaculate Conception, should not be portrayed with Jesus in her arms because that would be counterintuitive. Why? Because people get confused on that anyway. That they yes, the and, and, and as a practical matter, when she was conceived, she didn't, she didn't have Jesus yet. I mean, that would come later. So, anyway, here's a Francesco Pacheco's Immaculate Conception, okay? And um, I just got these off the internet. Okay? The color here isn't as, uh, it's not showing up as clear as maybe, let me see, I don't know if there's a, uh, is this shut off in part of it? Yeah, yeah, there's, yeah, you see a little more of the, the blue there. It's actually more blue in mind. Um, with the white and the, the uh, dark yellow color, uh, of the sun in back of her. She's got 12 stars. She's over the crescent moon, okay? And um, then we have uh, Velasquez's Immaculate Conception. Similar, but he, he doesn't do the crescent either way. He just has her standing over the moon. More, you could say, uh, true to Revelation 12, which doesn't speak about the crescent of the moon. And, um, you know, portrays her in a slightly different fashion, uh, but basically the same. Okay. Um, again, 
you can't see that, her, her um, outer garment is, is blue in mine. It's not showing up there as well. It's just so dark. And um, here is Murillo's Immaculate Conception. You can see more blue there. Okay? That's a very famous one. You can see the crescent of the moon underneath, pointing down. And um, he doesn't portray her with stars you know, above her head, the crown, for, for whatever reason. But you know, they're artists, and artists do what they want. How did he school for the hair? Unlike the other ones. Right. Pardon? Yeah. She didn't cover her hair. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yes, it is. Yes. Like a typical um, Jewish lady. Yeah. So yeah, like like here and oops, and here. Oh, let's see, that was close. Yeah, you can. See that? Okay. Just comparing them. Anyway, you can get on the internet and, and view uh, their their different depictions because each of these artists had uh, many different uh, versions of of basically you know the same work, but with you know they added some things, maybe deleted some things, whatever. This is just a a brief sampling of, of what they were doing here. Let me see if we get another one. Oh, oh those are bottoms. Okay, another one. And um, you know, if you know about the the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe, um, you know, very similar to to something like this. She's got the sun standing before the sun, the moon under her feet. And um, on her head, a crown of 12 stars. So it's you know, very uh, true to Revelation and um, in trying to show that purity of Our Lady, always with you know, her hands folded in, in prayer. And I think that's, let's see, you know, that's, that's all. Okay. So, what's that now here? if anyone wanted to uh, make notes of, on any of what I've written there if you haven't. Yeah. So it's interesting that um, you know artists would struggle with, with trying to conceptualize and immaculate conception took place um, in art. And uh, with the help of a, a mystic, St. Beatrice de Silva, um, they did so, and that became you know, a popular motif, you could say. He's got a question. Oh, yes. So, just so she's supposed to be represented, you said, 12, 13 years old, you know this? Yeah, that, I mean that's that's the common thought. Mary was you know 13, 14 years old when she conceived Jesus. Mm -hmm. and, you know, how old uh, do we suspect she was when she was assuming that? Do um, we speculate about? I think Father Harden I saw once. Uh, he thought about the year forty-eight. You know, <clears throat> I don't know how he arrived at. But um, you know, about 15 years after after Jesus uh, ascended into heaven, Mary was assumed into heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Mary of Greta may, may be more specific, but I, I can't recall specifically. Um, actually, Mary of Greta has some interesting comments on um, that comments, but what, what she was what was revealed to her in regard to Mary. Mary was taken up into heaven before she made her final assumption. I won't say anything other than that you can read it because it's it's a little involved and um, this is not doctrine, okay? But um, I think well, it's it's consistent with uh, with who she is and, and what God wanted her to do, okay? 
that I think Mary the Greatest says that God took her to heaven and gave her the choice to either remain there or return to earth to be a mother for the, the early Christians, the apostles and others. And she says, well, I'll go back. So she did. It's a near-death experience, kind of. People report to have that happening to them, you know. Well, she was actually taken up into heaven. This yeah. wasn't like just... No, no, I, yeah. 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 So, but you can read Mary the Great, and she, she uh, has a, a number of, of interesting points that expound on all the different aspects of Mary's life, her immaculate conception, her assumption, her birth. It's, it's good reading. Anyway, we'll take a break with, with that and uh, return.